what I figured out is I'm the only one who always wanted to be in advertising. Funny enough, I very early, when I was 15, 16, thought it would be great to do this stuff that I saw on TV and in magazines. And um, I can't tell you why, but I had this urge all the time. So after school, I went, um, I had to do my military service first. But after that, I went into a school that would teach me how to do advertising. And I knew exactly that this is what I wanted to do. And I never met anybody else after that who was like that. I met an awful lot of people who were studying philosophy and then were taxi drivers in Frankfurt. <laughs> and, uh, and then they you know, somehow you know, moved into the business because they had to do something for a living. And I never, I was never someone who said, oh, I'm actually a writer, I'm actually a philosopher, I'm an intellectual, but I have to do something for a living. So I'm, I never would, I loved the idea of helping brands to communicate so they would become interesting to, to the consumer. I always loved this bit. Might be sick, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed or uh, can, you, can you define any, any uh, national specifics of uh, advertising, like uh, Latvian ads or German ads? Are there any, any difference between... Uh, um, no. The good thing is, the answer to that is no. If I would now try to recall what I was looking at yesterday in the jury, I could not tell you which campaign would come from which country. They, they, they now, nowadays they were all prepared for the show, so most of them are reprinted in English anyway when it's about print. Um, the languages they speak in the TV, I don't understand, so it could be, you know, I'm sorry for being so ignorant, but it could be all sorts of different languages for me, so I wouldn't know, I couldn't tell, uh, unless it's Italian you know. or yeah. but Slavic languages I'm awfully loves. So I wouldn't know where it is from, and, and the favorite campaign that we'll get a Grand Prix tomorrow night, this is why I don't say it out loud now, um, I've learned later I was from Kiev in the Ukraine, and was from Ogilvy. So I didn't see an Ogilvy specific thing in it, and I didn't see a um, idiosyncratic Ukraine kind of thing in it. It was just a very, very smart thinking, one for the executed. And I think this is a good sign, because we're in the world of global brands, and we're in the world of, of uh, human beings. I think that all the differences between the nations are not as important as the common things we have as human beings. Well, what gives me a reason to believe that? If you see the huge success of Hollywood movies around the world, then it is not because, for example, I don't know if you remember, remember E.T. It's not because E.T. was happening in the suburbia of Los Angeles, where they have specific lifestyles and cars and how the moms talk to their kids. It was irrelevant. The film was about a global truth, which is homesickness. So if you talk about a global truth like homesickness, you can even take that in a wrapping of suburbia of Los Angeles, or backyard of Latvia, or outskirts of Namibia. It doesn't matter. So we are in the business of global brands that only work globally because they deliver something for a human truth. A presentation day, at the day before yesterday, you showed us uh, some of your work, uh, um, um, probably it was uh, uh, best of the best or, or work you consider uh, which is successful. Uh, uh, may I ask you to tell us about your worst, or the worst, or best of your worst works? <laughs> yeah. uh, um, the worst work is not the worst work. If it's really, really shit, you tend to think this is the worst work. But funny enough, that at least gives you some recognition. You know? Your peers write on Facebook, did you see that crap in the WA? And uh, people yuck when they see it, and the client says, oh my god, we have the worst response ever, take it off air. People at least emotionally react to it. So worse than the worst work, is the okay work. So whenever we do something okay, you know, it's not really shit, but it's not great, we are lost. The middle ground is the most horrible thing. I always say 
the devil is not looking like they showed you in the old books, right? With the goat hoof and horns and a tongue coming out. Fucking hell, that's a sexy bastard. Everyone <laughs> would It's like, wow, that's... The... But he's shit hard. No, the devil will come in a gray suit, sit beside you in the tube, and you will not notice him. The middle ground is the devil. The gray, invisible middle ground. Um, maybe say that the uh, devil lives in focus groups. Oh, devil invented focus groups. <laughs> devil invented focus groups. I know that many, many clients, and I will also explain why they do that, tend to believe in focus groups. <coughs> because they are thinking they are minimizing risk. You know? It might kill off the brilliant stuff, because it's sh new stuff is shocking, and new, and new stuff that is shocking will never... Uh, let, uh, you know, if you get asked if you want to see that, everyone says no. So you don't show it and it never pushes things forward. But at least the very, very bad stuff gets sorted out as well. The thing is, you did not minimize risk with this, te with this technique. You just maximized invisibility. And that's the biggest risk you're in. You spend money as a marketeer on celebrating what you do, so others see it and fall in love with you. And you do that with something that's invisible, irrelevant, boring. Honestly, this is not minimizing risk. This is just minimizing the risk of being fired now and survive another 18 months until the, until the feedback comes in that we are not a sexy brand. Let's change the advertising agency. We are saying goodbye to the times when we um, have to call ourselves advertising agencies and where we do advertising. Mm -hmm. Advertising might be a part of what we are doing, but the thing that we are actually in this way is, 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 has to be called experience management more than anything else. I think that we are here to understand what is the true core and the true value of a brand and what, it is, what, what the brand has as a belief and then help this brand to behave and act accordingly. And the fact that we are not just helping them to talk about themselves, but help them to act, changes everything dramatically. So suddenly when we help them to act, we then involve someone who was never involved. We involve the audience. Because if there's action, it will lead to interaction. And there's some great examples um, happening everywhere at the moment, where I can see and it's not just within TBWA, but uh, everywhere I see that people rather want to deliver an experience to the audience than another preaching ad. Because if you know someone just tells me, I really love dogs, and he repeats this like, you know, in a, in a typical Excel spreadsheet, media agency kind of way, I love dogs, and you switch channels to, I love dogs, you know, it's okay, he loves dogs, but when he then starts to say, stop. There are many, many dogs living in shelter homes, and we can't see that. We want you to adopt, adopt one. And uh, for everyone who doesn't adopt one, at least buy the food, because with the money of the food, we will help to build shelters so the dogs will not be killed. And we are doing that because we love dogs. So suddenly, a belief turns into a real action, which is the adoption drive. And suddenly, a brand like Pedigree is not a dog food manufacturer, but truly a dog-loving company. And suddenly, we want to have them as part of our community of dog-loving people. I have a dog. I love my dog. They seem to love the dog. We could cooperate. Maybe I even let them feed my dog. But it's, it's coming from action. And we, as, as people who come from advertising backgrounds, we are actually good in doing it. If we stop thinking about writing an ad, but if we say what we're really good at is understanding what brands believe and how they should behave, then we can be the heroes of this new era where we have to manage experiences for audiences rather than talking to them. Mm. If uh, advertising is about we are entertaining ourselves, then he's got it wrong. Mm. And people who take drugs and only do uh, work for award shows and, uh, you know, they are probably entertaining themselves. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we are in the entertainment business in terms of 
we have to create an experience for the audience mm. so that the audience would actually embrace a brand so much that they would go on a ticket for, I don't know, 80 to 100 euros to see his show. So he must de deliver something entertaining, so you do that. Mm. And brands also invite you to do that. But it must be as entertaining mm. as Robbie Williams' stuff. So you would actually buy a ticket for it. That's what we have to achieve. Because they are not waiting for it. It's not that they say, you know what? 33 minutes a day, I leave space in my schedule to listen to you. They don't. Mm -hmm. They couldn't care less. So we have to attract their attention. And that's what I mean with entertainment. Yeah. I have to deliver something that is of relevance, so they are listening to me, interacting with me, experience a good time with me. I have to deliver something as a brand that makes it that gives me a reason to exist. Otherwise, I'm just bothering everybody. All sorts of emotional things. I mean, I was talking about homesickness when I was talking about ET. Mm -hmm. That's an experience. Mm -hmm. You know, feeling homesick is an experience. And uh, and having a you know a moment to stop and think about something, uh, a charity course or something, it is an experience. And 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 this is what we have to create. And, and manage for our brands. Mm -hmm. I think I would not reject the client in the beginning ever. I think that the, the English would say, I told you once, I told you twice, but there's only so much I can do for you. So if uh, repeatedly someone would know better and not listen to advice, I would probably say, you know what, maybe we'll find someone else in my organization who takes care of them because it, it is useless me going there because, you know, they don't listen. Um, before, I would never reject a client um, because I have this, this belief that if someone is a client, he must be a company that is around. If he's a company around, he must be relevant to some people. There must be someone, something in his, in, his core, in his core that is of value. And if he has problems now, he probably has forgotten about that. Mm. And I am, as, a, as an advertising guy, very good at looking at that from the outside finding what is the value of this thing and then, you know, polish it, make it grow again and help him behave in a better way. He might behave in a very shit way, like you didn't take care of product, used cheap ingredients and people find you out all the time. They find you out. Or maybe he's distributing with a retailer who's really, really bad to the staff and people don't like that because they don't I think, think that's friendly, mm -hmm. you know. He, on the way, people make mistakes. But I think they once started off good. And if they are willing and able to listen to us and, and taking the help, which also crit means, it always means criticizing them. We cannot believe that someone comes to us and says, whoops, I want to give you my budget because, you know, lately we are like, and you're like, and the client service says, but don't you criticize them. Yeah? Don't tell them what they did wrong, you know. No, I think what we have to do is we have to tell them, okay, we looked at it, and we think there's reasons why it doesn't work that well. And that those reasons are not so good behavior, obviously, right? <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't go pashy. So, so that's that's what that's the business we're actually in. So I would not reject the client ego because there's something in his core that I like, and if he listens, it's good. If he doesn't listen, I'll be others to take his money. Mm -hmm. I, I I I wear Adidas because. I believe in this impossible is nothing. And I'm, I'm using <laughs> Apple products, um, and and I really, really do believe. I, I love to go to McDonald's. You know, it's not the only thing I eat, obviously, but I love to go there. I love the new 1955 burger, and then they asked me to launch it. I, I very often love these things. You know, it's it's. I think this is part of it. And if you deeply, you know, despise it, you better not work on it. You ask a colleague, could you take care of this mandate because, mm. or the company decides, you know what, thanks but no thanks, but working for it, if you despise it, never really works out. We leave great brands behind, and brands are one of the driving forces in our world. Mm -hmm. And the rule, for, by the way, for architects is also 95 to 5. The problem is the 95 shit stays longer.
Your aunt is gone next week. This shit stands around you. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's true. Yeah. So they are really crying into their pillows because they drive by this bullshit. And then this guy gave me the money, made me make it like this, and now it looks. And for 100 years, mm. they want to commit suicide. So architects is really tough. Oh, okay. I think the, 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 the biggest idea, not only uh, in the sense of idea, but also in size, that I was, that I'm really famous for is the, all the landmark, the landmark idea for, for Adidas, right? Mm -hmm. Not doing advertising, but understanding the people who come to the country as tourists and therefore doing landmarks instead of advertising. I think this is the biggest idea I'm famous for mm -hmm. and turned out to be the biggest executions I've ever done. I mean, no. I would say, um, and, and you don't know the work because it was only in Germany, so this is why it's hard to say, but I launched the A-class of Mercedes-Benz in 1997. And I launched it in a very, very disruptive way. Um, you must imagine the A-class was the first time that Mercedes was not doing a classical limousine, mm -hmm. but doing something really, really what you never expected from Mercedes to do, a small car with intelligent concept and, and oh my, very disruptive. So, and uh, I had a wonderful strategist I was working with, uh, Alison Cigar. She's uh, from the UK. She worked at BBH and worked with us at Spring and Jacoby. And she came up with the, the, the proposition that was called um, the A class is, 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 is just the metal expression of Mercedes's courage to seek change. And she was, and we did a campaign on that then that was called We Believe in the Next Generation. And this whole ad was just filled with wonderful, wonderful emotional images of children playing. This was all, that, there was children playing and then there was titles coming in, right? There was a little girl and there was just the question. Maybe the first man, uh, man on the moon? There was a little girl and we asked, maybe the next UN General Secretary? Mm -hmm. Then there was a black boy and we said, is this the president, next president of the United States? <laughs> <laughs> and then just, we had a pack shot of the A-class, only as a pack shot. It was not in the whole ad, it was only at the end, for a launch of a new car, imagine mm -hmm. it. We believe in the next generation. This ad was launched and three and a half weeks later, Fortunately, 95% of all Germans knew the ad and the A-class. So it was a tremendous success. Unfortunately, 95% of the Germans knew the A-class and it was falling over. So the big success of the, of the launch was then exploding in our face because when this el the moose test or elk test as they called it and the A-class tippled over, it was, the scandal was as big as the success of the, mm -hmm. of the launch campaign. But then we didn't stop, then we said, okay, we're going to now take uh, Electronic Stability Program, ESP, build it into the A-Class, give it away for free, give us three months time, we come back and relaunch. We then in February 98, I did a newspaper campaign. And this newspaper campaign was the relaunch campaign for the A-Class. And I was not talking about what, what we did, but just in a small line under the A-class I said, now with ESP. But the whole double spread ad in newspapers was Boris Becker, the tennis player, talking about, um, I've learned more from my failures than I learned from my successes. The next ad was, it, it's not a problem to fall down, it would only be a problem not to stand up again. So I only had Becker's insights into the world in sport. And then a little, and said the, the A class is back again now with ESP, and that then that became the print ad, a uh, print campaign of the year '98 in Germany. So I was very proud of that because I was starting off, you know, very euphoric, crashed to ashes, mm -hmm. and could come back euphoric again. So that, that's what I'm very very proud of. And then two years ago, a client service guy who was working on the campaign sent me just a picture of Obama and said. You knew it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs>